Welcome to the Horse Hour podcast. We're at the National Equine Forum, where 250 of the top of the industry get together every year to discuss how we can improve the equestrian industry, from scientists to animal rescue people. Today, we want to welcome Jim Green. How are you, Jim? Very well, thanks, Amy. Now, you're speaking at the forum today, but for you, this is extra special because last year you won the Sir Colin Spedding Award. That's right, and uh, this year I've been asked to give the memorial lecture. And so uh, it's a real privilege. So what is it that you do? You work, you've worked in fire and animal rescue for quite a few years. Yeah, so I joined the fire service in 1996 in the New Forest and uh, followed in my, my father's footsteps. And it soon became evident that um, my agricultural and rural background would help to improve our operational response to animal rescues. And uh, that's where it all started, really. And from there, then, are you still with the fire rescue now? Yes, I'm with Hampshire Fire Rescue Service. Um, I'm a a whole-time career junior officer. Mm -hmm. And I'm also an animal rescue tactical advisor, which means that I get sent uh, to incidents involving animals, a whole range of different circumstances, from trapped large and small animals to uh, other incidents that we attend as an emergency service where animals are present. God, that must be heartbreaking for you sometimes to see. We see videos on Facebook all the time and YouTube of horses that are stuck. You guys come along and you have the big hoists, you get them out and you do an incredible job. That's very kind. It's uh, Yeah, it's, it's just really a, another um, aspect of the diverse role of the Fire and Rescue Service. And historically, I don't think people recognise the risks uh, that animals posed Uh, when they're in stressful situations and couple that with some of the behavioural challenges associated with people uh, that accompany animals, then um, it really is incumbent on us to protect the public, to look out uh, for the welfare of the animal and, um, and keep a cool, calm, collected head as we resolve the situation to get the best outcome. Well, we look for you because we're too busy panicking ourselves, going, oh, they're going to die, you know, and we're heartbroken and we're emotional and you kind of need someone that's got a sensible head to say, right, okay, let's risk assess the situation. How can we get them out quickly? Yes, absolutely. And um, I think animals respond better to people that are, you know, kind of coming in with a steady demeanor. And um, people that have animals as, as family members, you know, their emotional attachment to the animal uh, can, can put more anxiety uh, onto the animal and cause the unwanted behaviors that we see from the scared or, um, you know, sort of anxious animal. So let's talk about the Sir Colin Spedding Award last year. It's at the National Equine Forum, presented by Princess Anne. What was that experience like for you? Well, I actually wasn't there to receive the award last year. and um, my... Oh, you missed out on the chance of meeting her. Yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> fortunately, I've, I've met Princess Anne on, on a few occasions and uh, she's actually been a, a real advocate of the Animal Rescue Initiative over the years. Um, back in 2007, we launched what we called the Emergency Services Protocol, which was a, a joint initiative between the British Equine Veterinary Association, British Horse Society, and uh, and myself and colleagues from Hampshire Farm Rescue Service. And that's where, you know, the journey to improve the whole kind of multi-agency approach to rescues and involving the vets. That's where that all started as we uh, spoke to a range of people from the equine industry at Buckingham Palace Mm -hmm. and uh, and launched this concept that um, actually animal rescues need to be approached in the same way that we do any other emergency. And we're very much reliant on our veterinary colleagues to give us the control measures uh, that we need, as well as the medical support for the animals that are in distress. And particularly with horses, uh, very powerful animals, and when they're scared, you know, then there's very little that we can do to physically control uh, that, that, uh, that reaction. And therefore, we do need to have the chemicals on board, the drugs that our vets can give us in terms of sedation or anesthesia to get the job done safely and to ensure that the animals um, don't suffer any more physical injury or indeed mental um, instability following the incident. Mm. I I saw an awful thing once. There were 20 horses that were abandoned. Um, They were fly grazing and they all needed rescuing because the floods came in and they they were stuck on this little island. Literally, it was was in Hampshire um, and they couldn't get out. It took a month to get anywhere near them to be able to get them out. Finally, the um, the emergency services weren't involved. It was a charity that were involved in rescuing them. 
and they couldn't get the horses because they were in such distress. They couldn't get the horses into the lorries to be able to rescue them and get them out. Mm. And one of the horses ended up jumping the gate and running into the crowd because it was just the most horrific experience. And that was many, many years ago. And I'm thrilled to hear that you've put this initiative together to be able to help those horses and also people that are trying to save them. They're trying to do their best, but aren't necessarily educated enough to understand that you can you can sedate a horse to try and get it onto the lorry. It's better for it at the time to get it out and get it to a safe place. And that's where I think your team really comes in and, and does an amazing job. Yeah, and, and this is where this whole kind of team effect comes in because, you know, when you're dealing with a situation like that, it really is um, requires the all of the input from veterinarians, from welfare organisations, from the rescue organisations to come up with a tactical plan that's going to be safe and that's going to be in the best interests of the animals. Because often if they are in that situation, if they're marooned, for instance, you know, unless the situation is going to deteriorate, it, it could be the best idea is to leave them in situ. We do then need to get out messages to the public to explain why that decision has been taken and why that's in the best interest of everybody. But, um, you know, this initiative really uh, is not just about the first responders having better understanding. It's also about educating um, animal keepers. We're seeing more and more spate conditions like the flooding that you identified. And, um, you know, it really is important that people that own animals have a plan and that they know what to do. If the situation starts to deteriorate, they've got a backup plan. Um, I've just come back from California where they've experienced um, some of the worst weather conditions uh, for several years. started last winter with, with severe rain and uh, a huge amount of flooding and uh, a huge dam dis- or potential disaster nearly occurred where the sheriff decided to evacuate 200,000 people at a moment's notice. Now, with those 200,000 people come numerous animals. Then later on in the year, we had significant wildfires that many, many people will be aware of. And uh, I was involved with going behind the evacuated lines of the Sonoma and Napa Valley fires to assist with the welfare considerations of animals that couldn't be evacuated because the fires came through very, very quickly. So even even when you have got the best preparation in place, sometimes you know the situations overcome us, uh, and the emergency responders will then need to go in and do the very best they can. But it does highlight the fact that you know in those difficult situations when emergency responders are very busy with with human life risk, then uh, you know the better prepared that we are for those situations then uh, the better the outcomes for everybody and that's what you're talking about today is how we can be better prepared yes I, i'm going to really talk about how the animal initiative has has come about some of the drivers for change and this where we are now uh, and then i'm going to look at the future challenges and some of those challenges are around humans uh, and human understanding of risk and and uh, and particularly those that uh, have animals need to think that this may happen to you you know these situations occur on an almost daily basis in my operational life you know so for the vast majority of people they think it won't happen to them but Mm. you know testament to the fact that we're going to these jobs every day we know that uh, that they can happen and how devastating they can be so we really encourage people to um, you know be as prepared as they possibly can and we want to to help them to um, put those preparedness measures in place and there's also the fact that the rescue services uh, and the funding situation these days will have a bearing on the amount of resources that we can send to any incident and so you know there again you know if you people want us to do the very best for their animals then you know they do need to think and take responsibility for what might happen and and help us so that um you know it reduces the impact on us if if a situation occurs so can you can you give us some of your expertise now then like, what, where are we right now as the situation stands well, I think um, you know there's a range of, of issues that can arise from fires to floods to entrapments to transportation um, incidents. And we've actually just run a survey through BARTA to just look at the, the scale of incidents that occur to horses when they're being transported. And, and the results of those, that survey is going to be launched in the spring. Um, but it's clear that um, sometimes people don't, take um, sensible precautions they perhaps don't 
always train their their animals to load effectively they don't always um, maintain their vehicles um, to the standard that we would hope and you know if animals are um, are going to get into trouble then Mm. transport is one of those situations where it's going to happen and it's going to go bad really quickly and it's going to have a major impact so sometimes it's it's really you know, not in the uh, in the hands of the person that owns the animal. Sometimes it's it's other people's behaviour. Sometimes it's other drivers that don't understand. You know how um, people with livestock or, or horses are actually needing to to drive or to behave. Or, um, and um, so there's a whole range of education measures that that need to be you know rolled out to the general public, to the animal owning public, uh, and also to the emergency services. We're training uh, Highways England traffic officers currently because they deal with around 4,500 incidents on the strategic road network every year involving animals. Oh, my gosh. Now, that's a a, a lot of animals. And uh, apart from the impact on the the animals and the the keepers, uh, there's also an economic knock-on effect that costs the country around £10 million every year from the, the network being held up. So, you know, Highways England have identified a risk to their um, traffic officers from animals that are stressed, and they have also identified a, a, a risk to the economy. So, therefore, we're equipping them with the skills to make strategic decisions. Um, some of those situations, they'll be able to resolve themselves. So we're teaching them how to put on a head collar, how to approach a horse, how to look at its behavior and demeanor to see whether it's actually going to be, um, they're actually going to be uh, capable of taking control of the animal or whether, you know, its um, anxiety levels are high and they need to kind of reduce the stimulation and call in people that are going to be able to resolve it for them. But, um, you know, that really takes, um, you know, for the, for the member of the public whose animal is in distress, you know, it takes quite a lot of self-responsibility uh, and they, they also need to, you know, have some self-control at the scene so that, you know, they're thinking straight and uh, they have the ability to perhaps call someone to support them at the scene or they have somewhere that that animal can go um, when it's been you know rescued from that that difficult situation well that's our worst nightmare isn't it it's driving down the road and the, the the lorry breaking down or you get a lorry fire and you've got to get the horses out on the motorway which is dangerous and I do hear of these stories happening quite a lot or there's an accident or you could be stuck in traffic and as normal things overheat and that's already a stressful time for the horse. The last thing you want to do is take the horse off the lorry in the middle of the motorway. But sometimes you don't have that choice. Well, absolutely. Yeah, that is the last thing that you want to do is to is to take the, the animal off of the vehicle because um, you're then potentially making the situation a lot worse you're potentially putting the public and other responders at risk so that is a that's a difficult call to make uh, obviously you know if if your vehicle is on fire and it's directly in, impacting your animal then that is a decision that's got to be made but we would prefer that that situation didn't occur in the first place or that you had the means to to deal with that situation so you know thinking about preparing before your journey having phone numbers of the right people to call, um, so having you know, had some training in how to use a fire extinguisher, having having a fire extinguisher on the vehicle, just even illuminating yourself, you know, so making yourself safe by having a high visibility vest in, in the cab with you so that if you're getting out of the vehicle on the carriageway, then, you know, you're you're being seen by people and, you know, you're doing everything you can to mitigate the risks to you and your animal. Jim, you know, these things sound like such common sense things, but I hadn't even thought about it until you mentioned it. Hadn't even thought. It wouldn't even enter my mind to have a fire extinguisher in the cab. But actually, yeah, it's it's, it's sensible to do that. Well, without it, uh, a small fire can take hold very, very quickly and will impact on, on the whole vehicle. And, um, you know, particularly on a, a motorway network where traffic will quickly build up, it takes longer to get emergency responders to you. So it can that'd be an absolutely catastrophic situation if it were to occur. So thinking, you know, ahead of time, maintenance, whilst it might not be something that is, uh, you know, the foremost of your mind when you're preparing for show season, is actually really fundamental. And, um, you know, things like having uh, your tyres inspected, um, your floors inspected, 
Um, we had a, a, a particularly harrowing situation with a horse called Spencer. His owner was very, very um, conscientious and she'd taken her vehicle to, to be um, serviced. Um, but one of the things that they hadn't checked because it didn't form part of the checks was actually the integrity of the floor. And under the uh, rubber mat, the, the wooden floor had um, rotted away in one corner. And as they no. pulled into a, uh, an event, Spencer actually put his, his leg just in that, that wrong spot his leg went down and, and through the floor of the vehicle and as it rolled forward his leg went between the back wheels uh, of the of the lorry oh poor spencer when we arrived in you know, it it looked really catastrophic but um the quick thinking vet who was actually competing in the event uh, sedated spencer the animal rescue team knew instinctively what was required the people at the scene behaved impeccably. They they remained quiet. They reduced stimulation, and they did everything right to set the scene for Spencer's rescue. And uh, we chose, in consultation with our vets, to anaesthetise Spencer, and we jacked up the lorry and we removed the outer wheel, and we removed his leg, which was actually tucked. It was underneath the, the wheel itself. Mm. We we got him out, and uh, we used our animal rescue techniques to manipulate him out of that um, that hole and down his ramp and we recovered him successfully and that was really testament to everybody at the scene knowing what to do and going into that kind of that whole emergency service and preparedness mode dealing with the situation calmly and um, professionally and he, he's gone on to make a full recovery oh that's amazing and, uh, you know, if um, we, we put that out on our Facebook page and in three days it reached 1.27 million people. Mm. And the important thing about that is that we were able to get safety messages out. And, you know, of those 1.27 million people, many of those would have had horses and many of those people would have gone out the next morning and tested the integrity of their floor. Yes. So there's actually nothing that that person on that day could have done any differently, really, to stop that incident happening. But it does just reinforce, you know, some of the problems that can occur and help other people to uh, to avoid that unnecessarily happening to them. So who calls the animal rescue service then? Is there a, is there a number do, or do we phone the police and then they phone you? Because going back to, you know, p- previous incidents that, I, that I've seen, I, I wouldn't know how to get hold of you. Well, the fire and rescue service throughout the UK, 90% of the fire and rescue services have an animal rescue component. And uh, that's a a really reassuring thing because it means that if you have a trapped animal, you can dial 999, you can ask for the fire and rescue service and give them as much information about the situation as possible and they will send the right resources. Mm. So uh, in our county, we have two animal rescue vehicles and we have four fire stations that are trained in animal rescue techniques and then all of the other fire stations are trained to know you know the needs of an incident that has an animal involved and so you're going to get a very robust response from most counties these days to that animal rescue the control room uh, if you are unable to call your own vet the fire control room or the police control room will actually look up the nearest large animal vet in the directory that we've prepared for them. They're not a blue light service, so the quicker we get our vets on the road, the better it is. Uh, Because, as I said, they are the fundamental uh, linchpin to any rescue to provide the control measures and you know, the medical support to the animal. So it is a, a very much a joined-up affair. But this is, this is uh, an incident involving an animal, and it's just another hazard that we have to deal with. It's uh, it's about managing risk and it's about meeting societal needs. Um, people expect us to turn up and rescue their animal. Mm. And uh, we, we're doing that for a range of reasons to to prevent people getting hurt, because if we don't, we don't have the skills to rescue the animal then someone else will step in and try and help and then they may end up getting very badly injured Mm. so it's really important that um, we as emergency responders have the sufficient knowledge to resolve the situation but it is a team team effort and if it does happen to your animal i really encourage you to stay as calm as you possibly can even that that will go against everything that your body is telling you to do but you know if, if you don't stay calm then the situation can get a lot worse. Um, what if we're a vet and we'd really like to get onto your list because we want to be there to be able to help? How can we do that? 
Well, the British Equine Veterinary Association um, holds uh, a list of practices that have agreed to uh, come and support the emergency services at an incident. And that's also enhanced from the cattle, British Cattle Vets Association list of practitioners. But the British Animal Rescue and Trauma Care Association actually have training now uh, specifically for veterinary practitioners to interact seamlessly at the scene of a multi-agency incident and to perform their professional role. And that's a little bit different to perhaps the training that they've had at university. And vets aren't usually working in a multi-agency environment. And we, we work you know, very closely with our emergency service colleagues. And, and sometimes if you haven't had any training as a vet, you can feel a little bit uncomfortable um, walking into that sea of helmets and different <laughs> colors and tabards and, you know, the whole scene can look very chaotic. But actually, we have a very clear way of working and it's known as the instant command system. And the instant command system allows us to perform our, our role without being overburdened with responsibility it means that we're, we're not um, you know going beyond our limits and it relies on um, safety being at the top of our of our thought process and and also looking at the roles that we have to perform and this, what we call the spans of control the lines of communication that are being thrown at us and if we are exceeding five lines of communication at any one time that's that being bombarded with with, with different um, people maybe police the owner uh, the tasks that we've got to do, uh, the responsibility to give other people tasks and so forth. Uh, if, if that gets too much, then we're not going to be effective. And so what we do is we have a, a, a delegation process where we have someone in charge and then we have people performing specific roles within that. Mm -hmm. So those are the sorts of things that we teach the vets. Uh, and then we go through a series of case studies where we take you know, the medical uh, knowledge that they need and we couple that with the knowledge of the incident and the safety considerations and the tactical plan is is created and we work very closely together to to yeah, resolve the situation uh, and we found that this has paid off uh, in our operational incidents because when vets have had training they're able to cope with a huge amount more uh, for instance, we had a, a, an incident with a, a, a lorry that had rolled over. It had been hit by another lorry and it contained 10 polo ponies. And they were all trapped inside, as were the two drivers of the, of the lorries involved. And the two vets that attended that job in the first instance had both had training. They both were on the same page as, as me and my team. And that really was the, that made the difference in resolving that situation they decided that they were determined that there were seven viable horses to rescue and seven were rescued uh, in a in a timely fashion so oh no so the other three didn't make it well this was quite a, a, a big impact um one vehicle you know was hit by the other it was it was hit so hard that it, it actually rolled over and there were horses on board that were um, that were crushed, that had um, deep lacerations, that had fractures, that some of them were just never going to be repairable. Mm. Um, so it was a very traumatic situation. And, and one of the other sides of, um, of our training is about how to deal with these critical incidents and the stress that, that vets are under. Um, because you know this is this is out of their comfort zone often, mm. and if they felt the pressure uh, of of the burden of responsibility um, in its entirety, then that would be you know far too much to cope with. So we teach them that you know this is about a team. You know we we are all in a team. We all have different roles to play within the team, and at the end of the incident, when we're looking back and seeing what went well and what didn't go so well and how we could improve next time. Yeah, that's a learning experience and that's going to improve the outcome for another animal on another occasion. So, you know, that we, the way that we deal with that is very much in the sense that this is a learning opportunity and um, it's not something we should you know, beat ourselves up over if it doesn't go perhaps the way that we, we hoped it would. These are unpredictable circumstances, mm. as are every other rescue and emergency that we deal with. Jim, you make me feel so safe. I mean, touch wood, if anything was to happen, I'd want you there. I'd feel like, you know, I could just relax then and say, OK, you know, you know what you're doing. Your, your team are incredible. Te you know, save us. Well, you're you're fortunate, Amy, because you live in the same area that County. I respond yeah. to. <laughs>
<laughs> well, fingers crossed I don't need you. I mean, I, your team are amazing because there's another incident that happened last year where um, a, a lady was horse riding in the New Forest and it was particularly boggy. She didn't know the area very well and she got stuck in a bog in the middle of nowhere, had no idea where she was, got completely lost. And your team were out there within minutes. I mean, it was the fire brigade were there, the New Forest, um, what do they call them? The Agisters yeah, were there. Were they? The Agisters yeah. were there. And, and I was riding at the time. And actually, it was my first time riding since my accident myself, where I'd fallen off and had a head injury. Right. And so I went out for this nice, quiet little ride with my friend. And um, police came up and said, we're looking for this lady. We can't find her. You're on horseback. Can you go out there and see? So we went cantering around the forest, found the lady, bumped into your fire crew, who were incredible. I mean, from the word go, from the minute they got there, they were brilliant with our horses. They, they, we were part of, we felt part of the team. They mm. sent us out in one direction. They had search crews going out in another direction. We all had mobile numbers. We were all talking to each other, showing the areas that we'd covered. And we found her and she was fine. I was so impressed with your whole team and how they work together. And I and and I think unless you've been through that experience or witnessed that experience, you can never imagine how much goes into it, like the preparation you were saying earlier. And how I came away thinking, I really trust you completely. You know, I'm never gonna worry again. Well, that's very reassuring to hear. And uh, and I hope that's the experience of people around the country. Um, what we've done with animal rescue really is we've, we've proceduralized it. And um, we've taken something which often was a very chaotic situation where we were making it up as we went along, as was the case in the, in the old days. And we've taken that and we've actually put procedures against it. We've trained hard. We train uh, regularly. Uh, to deal with these situations now, just like any other uh, incident that we might attend as a fire and rescue service. And we take a lot of pride in being able to do that professionally. We take a lot of pride in working with our veterinary um, partners. And every, as I say, every day is a learning experience. This, this is not one of those situations which is an ABC science. You know, fire follows the law of physics. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we can pretty much guarantee what's going to happen if we apply a scientific approach to it. But animals are unpredictable. And they also pose a significant risk to us uh, if we get it wrong. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the most difficult situations that a firefighter will deal with. And that's why we're so, um, so I suppose, cautious when it comes to the safety side of, of an animal rescue. You know, we want to do things in the best possible way and to have the best possible outcomes. And so, you know, that, that really is um, where we've moved to over the last few years. We've, we've gone from a situation where how do we get the heavy thing out of the bog to now the approach is how do we provide a casualty centered rescue so that we get that animal out uh, in the best possible way with the best possible care and ultimately return it to its owner uh, in you know and and have the best outcomes possible mm. um so we we've taught i mean obviously it's great that you know that you can help us but ultimately we'd like to cut down the amount of accidents which is where your prevention comes in so do you have checklists or things that maybe you could provide us that we can say right okay uh We'll check everything on our, our lorries, make sure the tyres, make sure the flooring's OK. Um, when it comes to fl flooding, uh, how can we protect our fields from flooding and what do we do in those situations? So that actually we've got like a document that we can read over and, and go back to if we need it. Well, I think the key thing is working with our partners to identify, you know, where education is going to help people. And the NFU um, did a campaign in 2016, Horse Box Safety Week with the British Horse Society and there was some really good material that came out of that for how to deal with situations when they go wrong, how to prepare so that it doesn't go wrong and uh, one of the, the um, films I was talking about what to do you know, if the emergency does happen. So they're all on YouTube, they're a really good resource and um, you know, we're working with our other partners constantly to reinforce safety messages. Um, Barter sits on the um, Highways England um, national towing group for instance so we know that there's a significant number of incidents that happen with transportation so we're trying to look at all the ways that we can actually get our messages out to people we did a campaign on fire safety with the british horse society uh, we ran a, a safety conference uh, for them 
couple of years ago, and uh, those materials um, are available to people should they uh, wish to to um, you know exploit that because you know, often some very simple things that people can do will go a long way to stopping situations occurring. And fire safety, you know, from a fire service perspective, obviously is a is a big deal. Um, fires in in rural areas can be catastrophic. They can you know they can escalate very very quickly. We're often surrounded by flammable materials, and uh, and so you know historically fire safety law hasn't really affected people in agriculture, and therefore there isn't this kind of ingrained understanding and and um, passion to to make sure that fire safety is at the top of the agenda. Mm. But it can actually be devastating to lives and livelihoods. So again, that's another another area that we're working with our partners in the BHS. And uh, and you know trying to just to improve people's understanding and to see you know how some some very simple things can can go a long way. So how can we follow you on Facebook on Twitter where we can actually see these these um, th- these bits of advice? Well, yes, there's, uh, we have a Facebook page and the British Animal Rescue and Trauma Care Association. And there's also another one that people might like to look at, which is uh, the Friends of the Hampshire Animal Rescue Team. So that's Mm -hmm. following the uh, my firefighters uh, in Hampshire as they they tackle various things and looking, you know, around the country and and um, really uh, showcasing the work of other fire rescue services that are doing some some great work. You know, we we just happen to have um, been at the forefront of this, but this is a journey that everybody's on. And uh, I'm so proud that 90% of the UK Fire Rescue Service has an animal rescue component. I really hope that we can encourage our other emergency responders to take advantage of training. The Horse Trust we're working with to develop standards in um, equine handling and psychology. So they've been working with us to do uh, the Highways in England training. They also train police officers and fire officers from around the country. Uh, so working with working with our partners, um, this is a growing initiative. And yes, we really do value people's support. Barto is a community interest company. Um, it's a not-for-profit, um, something that I set up with my colleague, Professor Josh Slater from the Royal Veterinary College in, back in 2012. And um, yeah, we really do um, need people's support to, to keep the men- momentum up, to provide valuable resources for, for everybody. And, um, you know, and just to learn from each other, Mm. Um, having come back from California, I have a huge number now of contacts in uh, other countries uh, that have, you know, are are on a similar journey and we can learn from them and we can support them as well. Well, Jim, thank you. Thank you for setting up your initiative, because ultimately you're educating us and making it a lot safer. So, like I said, fingers crossed we're not going to need you, but for those that do, I'm, I'm very grateful to you. So, and, um, and thank you for talking at the NEF today. My pleasure. Thanks, Amy. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can catch all the podcasts from the National Equine Forum on their website. Just head to nationalequineforum.com and you can see them on our website, horsehour.co.uk. I hope you enjoyed the live stream and getting involved in the conversations, asking your questions to the panel and to the speakers just by using hashtag horsehour, hashtag NEF. You'll be able to replay the videos from the forum if you just have a look at their website and their YouTube channel. Now, this event wouldn't be possible without the friends of the forum. Our corporate friends are the Blue Cross, Dodson and Horrell, the Donkey Sanctuary, Hadlow College, New Shul and SEIB Insurance Brokers. Along with individual friends, thank you so much to everybody that takes part in the National Equine Forum and organising it and uh, making sure it's super successful every single year. We'd also like to say thank you to the forum sponsors Sponsors, Beta, British Equine Veterinary Association, the British Horse Society, Bransby Horses, the Jeffrey Scholarship Trust, Bedmax, HBLB, Red Wings, Weatherbees, the World Horse Welfare, the Horse Trust, BHA, which is the British Horse Racing Authority, the British Equestrian Federation, and our great supporters, Bully Davy, Craig Payne, NFU Mutual. And uh, we're proud to be supporters of the forum too. Really looking forward to next year. Already there's a date set. It will be the 27th National Equine Forum. And it takes place Thursday, the 7th of March, 2019. I can't believe we're talking about that already. So pop that in your diary, 7th of March next year. So I hope you enjoyed this year's National Equine Forum. I'll speak to you soon. You've been listening to Horse Hour. 
Join the community on Twitter, Mondays, 8 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Eastern, by using the hashtag HorseHour. Follow Amy at AmyStevenson1 and subscribe to us on Acast, iTunes, Stitcher and Player FM.